that. It's uh, This is John Horgan, the semi-regular correspondent for Science Saturday on Blogging Heads TV. And with me is one of the most famous skeptics, uh, uh, critical intellectuals in the world, Mike Shermer. So, Mike, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Well, I was trying to remember the first time we met. I think... Uh, it might have been exactly 10 years ago when you invited me out to give a talk to your um, your skeptic uh, audience out there at, uh, I think it's a Caltech room that you rent out. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was in 97. Yeah, we host all of our events, our public events at Caltech. It's uh, just down the street from our office, and it's a great center for science in Southern California. And we have probably one of the largest science audiences in the world, considering we have not only Caltech, but JPL, uh, you know, the NASA JPL facility that has 5,000 scientists and employees, and plus UCLA and USC and all the universities. So it's a pretty good area, and of course, Southern California is pretty well known for its uh, new age nuttiness, so uh, there's a kind of an interesting juxtaposition there between a lot of high-tech sciencey people and uh, a lot of new age weirdos. Well, I know that the, uh, I think I've, I've talked in that venue twice, one af once after the end of science, I gave a talk on that, and then after my last book, Rational Mysticism, and it's a very tough audience, but a really smart and engaged audience, so I I've really had a good time when I've, when I've uh, spoken there. Yeah, they, they ask good questions, that's for sure. <laughs> they do. Um, Mike, I wonder if you can, you've got sort of an interesting uh, history, um, I guess you went from one extreme to the other on your way to becoming a skeptic. So um, could you just tell us how you ended up where you are uh, intellectually? Uh, well, like anyone else, you just uh, when you're young, you explore a lot of different ideas and try different things. When I wasn't raised in any particular religious belief. My parents were just simply non-religious, and they had no college education at all. So I got no exposure to any of the interesting topics we, we will probably discuss uh, until college. And there I just tried different things. I had already become a, a, a evangelical, what we would today call an evangelical Christian, but it, there then it was just a born-again Christian in the high school. So that was 1971, and, and I was that until 77. Can and, you just tell me, how did that happen? Did you have a, some, a religious experience? Uh, uh, no, peer group. It, it was just a typical peer group thing. A lot of, uh, All my friends were doing it, and so I thought I'd give it a try. But once I gave it a try, it, it really worked for me at the time. I mean, it was... Um, it's it's classic case of, of the confirmation bias at work. Once you uh, believe something, you then find reasons to uh, reinforce that belief. You you look for confirmatory evidence to support it, and so on. And that's what I did. And the world made a lot of sense in the uh, religious worldview, looking at it through a Christian worldview. And uh, um, I went to Pepperdine University, which is a Church of Christ, very conservative school. In fact, I was one of the first, I was in the first graduating class from the Malibu campus. So, of course, it didn't hurt that it was in Malibu, but <laughs> but it was very conservative. I mean, uh, uh, Gerald Ford came to speak, and um, Ed Edward Teller came and gave his, uh, you know, mutual assured destruction speech about the importance of nuclear weapons, and uh, there was no dancing allowed on campus. You weren't allowed, ever allowed, into a, a, a dorm room of a member of the opposite sex. And you know, so but to me that all made sense uh, in my worldview. But along the way, I bumped into science. I was going to major in theology, and then I discovered because I wanted to be a college professor. Then I discovered to get a PhD in theology, you had to have uh, master four dead languages: Hebrew, Greek. Latin and Aramaic, and I could barely get through Spanish. So I, I switched fields because, uh, you know, I had to get a job at some point, and I switched to psychology, experimental psych, and there I was introduced to the methods of science, and that began my long deconversion experience. Yeah, um, and so then how, I mean, you really went from one extreme to, to the other, so why did you decide to recast yourself as a uh, skeptic, as a kind of anti-belief person. When, well, how did that happen? Yeah, it, I know it looks that way, but it isn't actually that way at all. It's because uh, most people think of skeptics or skepticism in a negative way. It's really just science. I mean, it, uh, any any scientist is a skeptic. Skeptics are scientists. It, we have to think of it as a tool. It's like science is a tool to understand the world. Skepticism is a tool that's part of science. 
that basically says that the null hypothesis is true. That, that is, whatever the claim is being made, it's probably not true unless we have evidence to the contrary. And so that's, you know, basic introductory research methodologies assumption. The null hypothesis is what we assume. Now, let's see if we can find evidence to... Um, uh, to overturn the null hypothesis and therefore support your thesis. And really, that's all skepticism is. It's just, it's just saying, that's nice, prove it. Let's look at the evidence. And, uh, you know, we're from Missouri. Like uh, uh, President Truman, you know, show me. Show me the evidence. Uh, like, in, let's take a specific case, Bigfoot. It's not that there can't be a bipedal uh, hirsute primate running around the hinterlands of northwestern United States. It, there could be. It's just that until we have a body, let's assume that there isn't. And, uh, and that's all there is to it, really. Well, when did you decide to found the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine and, and, uh, and all that stuff? Well, th there, there has long been, for the last uh, 30, 35 years or so, a, a skeptical movement in America led by people like uh, the amazing Randy and, and uh, Ray Hyman and other magicians and so forth. And so I remember in being in a graduate school in experimental psych, uh, working on a master's degree, and um, Uri Geller was all the rage. This is the mid to late 1970s, and uh, there were the psychics being tested like by uh, like Uri by experimental psychologists who had PhDs, and you know that's what I was training to be. So I figured, well, you know these guys are probably smarter than I am, and, and they say there's something to this psychic power, so maybe there is. And then I remember seeing Johnny. Uh, Johnny Carson's Tonight Show one night when The Amazing Randy appeared, and he was able to do everything Uri Geller could do uh -huh. uh, just using magic. So I realized, oh, wait a minute, there's something else going on here that scientists are trained to understand the world in a certain logical fashion. Nature may be complex and difficult to understand, but she doesn't purposely deceive <laughs> the way a human does. And so that, that made me realize that the assumptions on the part of a lot of scientists that these things are true, may, you know, it has to be further challenged in, from a different direction, that is from the skeptic's perspective. And that, that's what led me ultimately into the skeptical movement, which we started, we started the magazine in 1992. Why did you decide, so there's also the... Um Skeptical Inquirer, I guess, is the uh, the best known uh, skeptic journal. But then there, there's uh, I think it's called uh, Reason and Free Inquiry. There are these sort of um, uh, secular humanist journals that are very critical of religion. Not so much of parapsychology and all that stuff. But why did you think there was a need for another voice in this whole area? Well, uh, yeah, there are a lot of different magazines, although they do differ. Like Reason Magazine, for example, is a libertarian publication that deals mostly with politics and economics. And uh, Free Inquiry and the, and, uh, the Humanist are both um, humanist magazines. They, they don't do that much with science, although they do some. Uh, but they deal a lot with religion and abortion and uh, you know, First Amendment rights, things like that. And then Skeptical Inquirer and Skeptic are the two main skeptical publications. And I started Skeptic simply because I wanted to do my own thing. Um, it's just sort of the way I am, my personality. I was a college professor at Occidental College in L.A., and I was happy to just just do college professing for the rest of my life. It's a great great gig if you can get it. And uh, a Professor of history, is that right? History yeah, I, I was science? teaching history of science, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my PhD is in history of science. So, but then I, uh, you know, we started this the, the lecture series at Caltech, and we started uh, the skeptic as all oh, was just sort of a hobby out of my garage. It was just sort of a fun thing. But it, as it got bigger, and I grew less enchanted with college professing in 1997, um, when my book Why People Believe Where Things did really well, it got me thinking that maybe I could actually do this for a living. And within two years, I had uh, you know made the transition to um, doing do, running the Skeptic magazine full time, and and I quit teaching then. So I haven't taught really in almost ten years now. I just started teaching two years ago, and I'm still in the um, honeymoon phase. I guess I <laughs> yeah. still really enjoy it. And I, I must <laughs> it say it's a challenge. I, I'm teaching at this engineering school, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, that has a lot of very conservative students, including uh, young Earth. Creationists. Oh, yeah. uh, a lot of kids don't believe in global warming, <laughs> human-induced global warming. So, uh, which is for me, it's great. I mean, it's a real challenge. We have very lively mm -hmm. discussions uh, in class. So you don't, but you had enough. You don't miss it anymore. Oh, I, I miss the lecturing. I like lecturing to audiences. But I have a lecture agent who books me in 
maybe two dozen lecture gigs a year, and that that satisfies that that need, I guess, to lecture. Plus our own Caltech lecture series that I organize. So it's mainly the the lecturing, the performance in front of an audience part that I enjoy. Uh, you know, reading. Yeah, I've seen you. You're you're really good at it. Well, you're, you're very thanks. and you're great on TV and in radio formats, and you're you are a performer. <laughs> well, thanks. I, I learned that from watching people like uh, the amazing Randy and other professional entertainers that if you want to, really, if you want to get your point across, you, you, the, the, the way the message is delivered really does matter. Um, the image, all that stuff makes a difference. Uh, I mean, we, we all know that from mass media studies, but it's, it's absolutely true. So one of the things I'm trying to do with skeptics is um, show that we do have a sense of humor. You have to be funny. Uh, uh, warm and thoughtful and polite. Uh, you know, we're not just a bunch of uh, grumpy old white guys complaining about the world, although there are plenty of those. But, but in fact, the skeptical movement has really shifted toward uh, youth and uh, a diversity of people, not just old white guys, but uh, young uh, people of, of a great diversity. And because, as I said, skepticism is not a thing. It's just a tool that anybody should apply. And of course, people do. I mean, I was doing a radio interview this morning on 9-11 conspiracy theories, and, you know, of course, I was debating a guy who is a pro college professor, uh, a scientist, who doesn't believe that al-Qaeda did it. He thinks uh, Bush did it. And, um, and he had all his rational arguments, and he's skeptical of the government. So in that sense, you know, skepticism can be applied in many directions. Uh, by the way, we haven't mentioned that you're also a, uh, a columnist for Scientific American, so that must have really expanded your audience. Yeah, that's about the fav my favorite thing that I do, um, you know, because they have, you know, it's just almost a million readers, and, uh, and and every month they're skeptic. So, again, it's just a way of reaching more people. I find the letters probably the most interesting thing that I get um, whenever I mention something that pushes people's buttons, because uh, with skeptic, our... Our print run is about 50,000, so, you know, the Scientific Americans are an order, to, uh, an order of magnitude larger, so that gives me more feedback from people, and uh, that's probably the most enjoyable part of the job, is getting letters, just to see what's on people's minds. Even with that readership, though, I was amazed that whenever I write anything about evolution, I do get lots of letters from people saying I should be skeptical of evolution. So that yeah. really surprised me. Well, yeah, I, you know, as you know, I was at Scientific American... Uh, for about 10 years. I left there in, in uh, 97, and um, I had a couple of pieces on uh, parapsychology, and uh, there's one piece in particular where I wrote about a guy at uh, Los Alamos who was in charge of a fairly expensive weapons program, mm -hmm. non-lethal weapons, who had also written a book on how to use your psycho psychic powers to get ahead in business. <laughs> and, and so I... I wrote a piece just mocking him. I mean, it was very light. I intended it to be humorous, but you know, I guess it was kind of vicious as, as well. And <laughs> to my surprise, you know, you think you're preaching to the converted, yeah. writing for Scientific American. I got this flood of letters telling me that I was really close-minded and uh, excessively skeptical toward um, psychic powers and and uh, the paranormal. I just wonder if you've gotten those kinds of responses from Scientific American readers as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I wrote, um, uh, uh, one of my columns is called The Flipping Point, in which I basically confessed that I had long been a, a global warming skeptic, and not for any particular good reason. I hadn't really studied it that closely, but it just seemed like the environmental movement had exaggerated everything, and since I'd been in college, uh, you know, they had made all these claims that, that didn't come true, and I figured, ah, oh, you know, I just don't believe any of that global warming stuff. And then I actually read the, the data and looked at the articles, and I realized, oh, well, this is, you know, it's really happening, and it's probably mostly human cause. So that's what I wrote this column about. And I figured that was a sitting duck. I mean, this would just pass by uh, unobserved. Everybody would be just saying, well, it's about time you got on board. And, of course, I did get some of those letters, but I got hundreds of letters from people just irate, just furious that I would... Uh, you know, sort of betray the skeptical cause that global warming is a complete total scam. I even, I just briefly mentioned, yeah, I just briefly mentioned Al Gore and Inconvenient Truth in just one fragment of a sentence. And man, I got, I must have had two dozen letters telling me that I was now an ideologue, that I was in the pocket of Al Gore and the left wing conspiracy against uh, business in corporate America. And it, they just went on and on about this. And, uh, uh, I was amazed about that. There's a lot of readers of Scientific American that don't believe global warming is real. 
you know, this is what makes it so difficult to be a skeptic, is that uh, it's really hard and actually impossible to draw the line cleanly between what is credible and what isn't. I mean, there's some things that I think are just obviously beyond the pale. I mean, it, I don't know if it's even worthwhile writing about something like astrology anymore. Do you do you cover astrology? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't bother with that stuff anymore because it's all been done so much that. Um, and there's so many other more relevant topics, like for example the, the alleged link between autism and uh, vac- vaccinations that kids got. And uh, now those well, are. Uh, Where do well, you stand on that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of confused. I mean, I've seen, you know, I read the article by, I think it was Bobby Kennedy, or, uh, that was, uh, I mean, he was saying that the connection is real and and he thinks it's been suppressed by the sort of medical establishment. But then the New York Times shortly after that had a, uh, a debunking article. So yeah, the, the Times, I think, has got it right. And we have a, a cover story coming out in our next issue of Skeptic. Uh, in which I have a, a medical researcher basically summarizing all the evidence for and against. And basically the bottom line is this. They took mercury out of the vaccinations uh, back in the, in the mid-1990s, and uh, rates of autism have been going up ever since. So the, the correlation is simply not there. And in any case, even if it was, as we know, correlation does not mean causation, there's no causal vector that we know of that would... I mean, we know mercury in high doses is toxic, of course. Water in high doses is toxic. It's the, it's the dose that matters, and the doses, even in, in when they were, were using mercury, were so tiny um, that there's no way to know if that is the cause. But the other big problem is uh, is autism itself. What is it? I mean, there is no cut and dry. It's not like you either have AIDS or you don't, or you broke your arm or you didn't. Uh, it's one of these catch-all categories of illness that gets redefined. And so one reason for the confusion is that uh, it's not clear what constitutes autism. I mean, any, anything from As- Asperger's syndrome uh, all the way to completely low-functioning uh, kids that, can, that can't even speak. So... Um, that's, that, that has confused the issue, but as far as I can tell, there's no link. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the whole er- area of psychiatric diagnosis is, um, is, is just so murky. There was just a, a front page story in the New York Times about a, a, uh, an increase in diagnoses of manic depression among children of, I think, about a, an order of magnitude yeah. over the last 15 years or so. I know this also has happened with uh, attention deficit disorder, as you said, with uh, autism and Asperger's, uh, and um, you know these these diagnoses are so arbitrary. There are no really clear physical markers, and so uh, you know all of psychiatry is. Um, it's really questionable just how scientific it is. Yeah, so in, 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 this, yeah in this next issue of Skeptic that I mentioned, it's all devoted to medical controversy, not alternative medicine, but mainstream medical controversies, one of which I have a psychiatrist that basically says Tom Cruise was right, R- right for the wrong reasons, not because Scientology's got it right, but, but because there, there is a lot of room for skepticism in psychiatry, not, not just the overdosing of, of people that treat... Uh, mental diseases that way, but just even that concept of a mental disease, I mean, really, what is that? And uh, the fact that, you know, the most obvious example is that uh, homosexuality was considered a disease and on the books as a disease that should be treated all the way up until, I think it was 1973, when it was simply voted out and now it's okay. Well, wait a minute, right. voted in, voted out, what what in the world are you talking about? I mean, that would not happen in, in uh, other physical uh, medical problems, let's say. So, right. yeah, you're right. It's fraught with problems. It's a cultural change rather than a, a medical scientific change. Hey, listen, uh, I was really supposed to talk to you about um, your new book, which uh, I'd like to uh, segue to now. But first, I just want to... I'm holding up here. You can't mm-hmm. see this, of course. <laughs> a stack. Of, I just went over to my um, bookcase. I have five books by you, Mike, uh-huh. and I hope you are, I hope you are flattered because uh, not many <laughs> authors have that honor, so I've got the, um, the Skeptic Encyclopedia of Pseudoscience, yep. uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, I've got, uh, let's see, Why People Believe Weird Things, is that 
still your best known or best selling yep, book? That's that's yeah. my best selling book. It's probably sold more than all the others combined. <laughs> really? Wow, it's a great well, it's, style. It's, it's used for a lot of classrooms too, that helps. Yeah, um, well, I've used it a lot uh, as uh, background for, for uh, my own writing. Um, How We Believe, which is uh, uh, sort of, sort of um, why be people believe weird things except directed at religious belief, right? Yep, that's right. And then your latest, and of course I'm aware of some of your others. I wanted to talk to you a little bit later about the, um, the science of good and evil. Is that... Yes, the science and good of good and evil. But right now, I want to talk about this book. I'm holding it up right now. Why Darwin Matters. So this came out quite recently, right? Uh, the paperback just came out uh, this month, September, and uh, the hardback a year ago. So yeah, that's uh, well, it's sort of an interrupted uh, journey simply because of the Dover trial and all the rise of intelligent design. I thought I'd written what I had to say and gave, gave my piece and uh, why people believe were things. I had a couple chapters in there about uh, creationism and evolution. I figured that would be the end of it because uh, I wrote about the uh, whole chapter on the 1987 Supreme Court case in which uh, the law passed in Louisiana requiring that evolution and creationism be given equal time in public school science classrooms uh, was overturned, and on appeal it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. So it's basically Scopes too. Scopes never made it to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, but this one did. And uh, the Supreme Court voted 7-2 to two to uphold the ban on equal time laws. So when I wrote about that, I figured that's it. I, I can move on to other subjects. But then in in the late 1990s, this whole movement of intelligent design really took off. It's an incredibly brilliant marketing ploy on their part. It's one of those, um, it's one of those marketing brand names, uh, if you want to call it that, that is uh, what we'd say today is sticky. Uh, people get it instantly and it sticks in their mind. Intelligent design, yes, I get that. The watchmaker, yes, I get it. Uh, any, any, anybody that knows that, that doesn't know anything about biology immediately gets intelligent design. So that was very clever. So I, I wrote that book simply as a response to the new arguments that uh, they've put forth. Well, Mike, why? This is a question I have about this book, uh, but really about all your uh, all your other writings as well in Skeptic Magazine. Um, I guess the problem that I see is preaching to the converted. Are you, you know, so you're writing for people primarily, I would think, who are already um, on your side. Uh, Is there any evidence that you're uh, changing minds with, well, let's start with this particular book, Why Darwin Well, there's, um, of course, I don't do any surveys, but, uh, I mean, anecdotally, I get a lot of mail from people uh, that say, you know, they weren't sure what to think about it, and, and now, now they, they've come to understand whatever it is that the subject is of the book I wrote, and that changed their mind. Almost never do I get anybody that was on the other side that says, I read your book and changed my mind. That, that I don't expect to happen, and, and it, it rarely does. So my audience, which is the audience of Skeptic Magazine, is... The, well, we divide the world into thirds. So let's say one-third people are skeptics, one-third people are true believers... Uh, and the one-third in the middle aren't sure what to think. They've heard of, heard of some particular claim. They haven't really given it that much thought. They're open to the likeliest explanation once they hear it. And uh, so that's the audience we're after. And uh, I think those are the people I hope to reach. Uh, the skeptics are already on our side. The true believers aren't going to be uh, c- converted in any case. So, uh, But that's a that's a pretty vast middle ground, I think, on most subjects. Um, well, maybe you can... Um you can summarize what's in your earlier books, Why People Believe Weird Things and How We Believe, uh, when you respond to my next question, which is, you know, we've had this flood of books, going back to Darwin, really, explaining the world in scientific terms, in terms of evolution and physical laws and so forth. And um, many of these books explicitly say there's no need for a uh, creator, certainly not an active creator who's constantly... Uh, meddling in our affairs or in nature in general, and yet you still have, especially in this country, this highly technological, well-educated country, a tremendous number of people who prefer to hold on to what you and I uh, think of as completely irrational, superstitious beliefs. 
why is that? I mean, you know, you've got, there's you, there's Richard Dawkins, there's now, there's this whole wave of books. And I, I can't believe that you're actually really reducing the number of people who believe in, um, you know, the God of uh, the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Why is it so hard to change people? And it's not just uneducated people. As you know, there are highly educated, scientifically trained people. Francis Collins, head of the Human Genome Project, who still hold on to, uh, you know, evangelical Christian beliefs. Yeah, well, in Collins' case, he, he, he doesn't, he's not just still holding it. He converted pretty late in life. Um, yeah. And the, the short answer, well, it, it, in my book, Why People Believe Weird Things, I have a, the last chapter is why smart people believe weird things. And the short answer is because they're better at rationalizing beliefs they arrived at for non-smart reasons. <laughs> Which is to say that most of us, most of the time, for most of the beliefs we hold, we hold them not, not for rational, logical reasons, but for emotional, psychological reasons. That is, we were raised to believe that way, or our peer groups influenced us to believe that way, or we're influenced by our mentors, or teachers, or books that we've read, or leaders that we look up to, or social groups that we're a part of. And then we back into the belief after we've committed to it, and then and then find reasons to believe it. So, uh, what I argue with the the intelligent design arguments, for example, is these are pretty good arguments if you already believe. If you don't already believe, they don't hold water at all. And so it's really a form of rationalization. And uh, it's I don't mean that as a put down. Everybody does it. Uh, including you and I and all scientists and so on. Everybody, we're human, that's what we do. We look for and find evidence to support what we already believe. The difference with science is that if you don't find your biases uh, that are uh, clouding your thinking, uh, somebody else will, usually in a public forum with great glee, debunk you. Uh, science, as you know, is a very competitive, thick-skinned enterprise, and, uh, and there's a reason for that. Because of all the cognitive uh, fallacies and biases we're all subject to, you have to have those checks and balances. And uh, So what religious people are doing in uh, using intelligent design arguments to support the, their religious beliefs is no different from what say conservatives do to support their Republican beliefs or Democrats do to support their liberal beliefs or what anybody does. That's just what we do. Um, and so it shouldn't surprise us. Mike, let me just ask you um, about your own uh, spiritual beliefs now, such as they are. I, I've got an essay somewhere. Look, I, I've got, again, you're not going to see this. I am now holding up my Shermer file. <laughs> so not only do I have a giant pile of your books but you have your own file in my filing cabinet. So again, you should be um, very flattered. But I've got this essay in here that you wrote for one of these Templeton rags, um, Science and Spirit. I've written for them, too. Uh, and it starts by saying, I am an atheist. Now, I thought you've told me, and in fact, I thought that I've, I've seen you uh, describe yourself elsewhere as an agnostic. So mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, what you are right now. Yeah, well, the labels are troublesome. It, uh, and the reason I wrote that one was simply because in how we believe, and I said, well, I'm an agnostic in the sense that Huxley meant it, who coined the term in 1869, it's an insoluble problem. There, there's no scientific test we're going to run and say, oh, look, yes, there is a God, or no, there isn't a God, or anything like that. It's just not part of science. You can't test it in the laboratory. So that's what I meant when I said that. Well, I got a lot of flack from atheists, of course, said that that's too wishy-washy, and that the, the general public does not think of agnosticism in the way Huxley meant it. Most people receive that word to mean, perceive that word to mean uh, you're still waiting for more evidence. It could go either way, like global warming. Uh, is human caused or it isn't? Let's run some more experiments. Well, I don't mean that. So, if you mean, you know, by atheism, I don't believe in God, well, then okay, I guess I'm an atheist or a non theist or non believer or, you know, what the, the labels are troublesome because they're so loaded with baggage. What most Americans also perceive the word atheist to mean is, you know, you're a left wing liberal communist, uh, you know, you believe in sex, drugs, and rock and roll and abortion. And they lump all this other stuff in that I, I don't believe and that I don't yeah. care to be associated with. And so I just simply say, you know. You don't care to be associated with sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> Maybe the rock and roll part. <laughs> uh, well, so, you know, do I believe in God? No, I, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, maybe there's some 
some higher thing, entity force or whatever that gave the breathe the fire into the equations, as Stephen Hawking likes to say, something like that. Maybe I don't know, but uh, it's so far afield from what anybody means by God that it's for practical purposes. I don't believe in the God that most people believe in, and uh, so and since it's not something that's part of science, there's really nowhere else to go with it unless I have a personal revelation, which I, I haven't had. Uh, you know, who knows uh, where the universe came from. And it's the fact that we don't know where the initial Big Bang material came from. Well, then, uh, you know, it's just okay to say, I don't know, let's work on the problem some more, rather than uh, construct an entire religion around that uh, particular. You know, I, I was, um, I hung out with uh, Richard Dawkins at one of these, at a Templeton Fellowship for Journalists a couple of uh, summers ago. Yeah, and, he writes um, about and that. He just, and, pardon me? He writes about that in The God Delusion. Uh, that's right. And, yeah. and, uh, and he <laughs> described himself there as an agnostic uh, rather than an atheist because he said, just as we can't know that God exists uh, through science, we can't disprove the existence of God. Um, most, I, I, I find that uh, most skeptics I know don't describe themselves as atheists. I know very few people who, who use the word atheist to describe themselves. Well, well for good reason, atheist. John. I mean, in America, it's a real negative label, which is why a lot of atheists are trying to change it. I mean, it's like, why don't uh, homosexuals call themselves fags or queers? Well, because it's a nasty word now in our culture, so let's pick a different word. They, they started using gay, and that's become more acceptable, and that's why a lot of atheists are in search of a different word. The word bright was the wrong word. <laughs> but, that, but, but in principle, the, the, the search for a new label is certainly uh, a good thing. Well, Mike, let me tell you why I don't uh, call myself an atheist. I, so I call, describe myself as uh, an agnostic, and, and the reason is that um, the, the design arguments actually appeal to me to a certain extent. I mean, I think intelligent design, the way it's been presented now, is uh, foolish. But I, actually at the end of Why Darwin Matters, you describe a sensation that I often have as well, of this sort of sense of awe and wonder and uh, it, you, this recognition of the inc incredible uh, beauty and intricacy of, of nature. And I think that wonder leads to an obvious question, where did this come from? Was there a purpose uh, to it? W was it designed in some sense? Do we have a special role in it? The reason why no concept of God that I've encountered makes sense to me is uh, you know, what's traditionally called the problem of evil. So uh, it, life is so sort of random uh, and unfair and even seemingly cruel, but it's not, it's, it's a cruelty of indifference. You, you have this wonderful quote of uh, Richard Dawkins that, that puts it that way. Um, on the other hand, life is so wonderful very often and beautiful, and there are so many things that make my life worse, uh, worth living. It's kind of the flip side of the problem of evil, the problem of beauty and fun uh, that makes it impossible for me to completely rule out the existence of a of a creator, so I'm sort of trapped in between those two poles, and that's the only word I can find for that is agnostic. And when I read you, sometimes it seems that you're kind of in that same position too. Yeah, I'd say that's right. Again, if we can get away from the labels because people carry different meanings by those words, like calling yourself a feminist, you know, it's like I don't really know what's in your mind if I say that. So just. You know, just describe the experience as you just did. Yeah, the awe and wonder, the you know, the Sagan-esque uh, description of the cosmos, and and uh, you know that opening scene in Cosmos where he's uh, down the coast uh, from Big Sur on Pacific Coast Highway, and the waves are crashing, and he's talking about the you know sort of the mystery and awe of the whole thing. And uh, yeah, that's a form of spirituality. I think a lot of conservative religious people have sort of hijacked that word and said that's our word. Um, and New Agers have taken the word in, in yet a different direction, you know, spirituality in, in a New Age sense. Well, I, I, I don't think anybody has a monopoly on that word. I think uh, you, me, lots of people uh, simply look at the wonders of nature and feel a, a deep sense of transcendency, that there's obviously something grander than me, uh, and uh, the awe and wonder of it and the mystery, and that can evoke the kinds of emotions 
that anybody would describe as spiritual. And, uh, and there's lots of ways to, to get that. You don't have to pray. You can meditate. You can just sort of space out. Like in my case, when I'm out on a bike ride by myself, I just kind of space out and enjoy the, the wind in my face and the sun on my back and so on. And that, that's a form of spirituality. And, and uh, I describe in the book going to Mount Wilson and standing uh, inside the dome that houses the 100-inch telescope where Hubble discovered uh, the expanding universe and all that and uh, wow I mean I just get goosebumps when I'm there uh, and that's a form of spirituality so um, I think we, we can all be spiritual there's just different pathways to get there and it's not fair for anybody to claim they have a monopoly on it and when they do that's when we start getting into more serious political and social problems with religion Mike can you describe quickly um, the, um, the three models of the relations between uh, science and religion and how they might work because then I've got a point that, that I wanted to make about those the way you presented them that bears on what we've just been talking about. Yeah, I, well, it's just a useful uh, tool to get our minds around it. The conflicting worlds model is that there's a conflict between science and religion and you have to pick one. Uh, the overlapping model is that science and religion are just two different ways of coming at the same reality and we can find some sort of bliss uh, by harmonizing the two. And then the separate worlds model, which is that uh, science and religion are really two completely different enterprises that do different things and have nothing to do with one another. And I largely go with the latter one, that uh, mo most of what religion does when people say they're religious has nothing to do with trying to understand how the world works or the, you know, what's the origins of life or you know, where did that tree come from? Something like that. Most, what most people mean when they mean by being religious has to do with social aspects and uh, finding sort of meaning or morality. Or they go to church for reasons having to do with family and social, their social circle and their friends, and it, it gives a sense of social fulfillment. And science just doesn't do that. It's not what it's meant to do. And so, for the most part, I think you can keep them separate. Is that so? This is what Gould said, right, Stephen? Yeah, the non-overlapping magisteria. Yeah, it's a fine metaphor. I think it's. Uh, I think where it can be challenged, where he was challenged, and I have been as well with that, is when specific claims are made by religion that have a scientific bent to them. Well, in that case, uh, you know, the, now we have a conflict. I mean, the, either the world is uh, four and a half billion years old, or it's you know four thousand years old. Well, which is it? Well, in that case, we can actually answer that question, and that. So now that's no longer an article of faith. It's not part of religion. It's just an empirical question. How old is the earth? And, uh, and, and so if you insist that it's 4,500 years old rather than 4,500 billion years old, well, then we are going to have a conflict. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, okay, now I'd like to go back to um, what we were talking about before. And actually, I'll, I'll ask you about a word that you uh, coined in Why Darwin Matters. Let me see if I can pronounce this correctly. Sciencesuality? Yeah, sciencesuality, yeah. Sciencesuality. Yeah. So explain what that word Well, I'm just going for something like the sensuality, the sensuality of science, that it, it can be, maybe maybe spirituality, is, that's what I mean by that, sciencesuality. It's just a way of having an emotional experience with a scientific enterprise or the knowledge of science or something like that. It's, it's just a, a way of showing that uh, science is not just a uh, rational um, process that's also an emotional process and and you know we know from research on the brain particularly like by uh, Damasio that um, you really can't make decisions rational decisions without an emotional element to them we never have enough information uh, we're always acting under high levels of uncertainty think of the stock market for example and so no one's actually really rational in, in that Spock-like sense. We are all pretty emotional. So why not just admit it and say, yeah, science is like that too. It isn't this rational calculating machine. There's an emotional element to it, especially with the results and the implications of science and you know what it means for who we are, like the study that was published this morning in Science about how children are... Uh, uh, infants are more intelligent than, than chimpanzees socially. They're socially more intelligent, and that's because we're a more social primate species than chimps. And I, I get uh, I get kind of goosebumps over that, that findings like that because it shows that yeah, we really are a special species because we're so social. And uh, that says something deeply to me about religion. Why religion is so successful because it's so social. It's tapping in to those social networks that are incredibly important for us. Well, let me just say what um, 
that word reminded me of, and your whole discussion surrounding it, is of something I tried to get at in my last book, Rational Mysticism. So I was looking for a way to uh, show that uh, science and religion or science and spirituality, whatever you want to call it, are in some sense compatible. And I think in lots of ways they, they are not compatible and they are in conflict, as your first model uh, describes it. But the one way that they are compatible uh, for me is that they both evoke this sense of uh, awe or even uh, miraculousness. So the way that religion does it is emotionally. So you have various uh, rituals and uh, texts and uh, doctrines that give you a sense of the grandeur of existence and our kind of smallness and in relation to uh, to God or whatever intelligence is behind all this, and so that's kind of this emotional, visceral uh, mm -hmm. sensation, and sometimes you get that in a really powerful way in a religious experience. And science, I think, leads intellectually to that same sense of wonder and awe. So you've got with science, in spite of all that it, it has explained about nature, you keep coming back to these core mysteries. The origin of the universe is the greatest one of all. Why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, the origin of life is still a complete and utter mystery. And then why, once life began and started evolving, should it create something as uh, improbable as us, these creatures that can ponder their own existence and feel awe and wonder uh, about it. So I, you know, I see that as actually um, an example of the kind of convergence mm -hmm. that Model 2 uh, is uh, getting at. Yeah, the shared experience. Yeah, well, the shared experience of that sense of awe and wonder, yeah, okay. But th the problem I have with the convergence model, the overlapping models there, is uh, the attempt to say harmonize the book of Genesis with scientific findings and insist that, well, we know Genesis has to be right, it appears to be in conflict, so let's see how we can tweak it and make right. it fit. I find that a, a useless enterprise because I don't think the book of Genesis or any of the books of the Bible are meant to be a science book, a history book, a book of geology, a book of cosmic origins, you know what? Uh, all origin myths, all myths have origin stories. That's part of the this, you know, it's part of the package. But, um, but, but our our origins myth is science. In that sense, science is a myth. It's a it's a storytelling mechanism, but it's a storytelling mechanism with a huge difference. There's at least a way to get at the way that world actually is, despite all our biases. There's some self-correcting machinery built in there. Whereas all previous myths are just you know, they're just based on where you happen to be born in the world and, and uh, uh, what your parents happen to believe. So, I mean, uh, so many Americans, what something like, I don't know, 70, 75 percent would call themselves evangelical Christians. Yeah, but if they had been born in India at the same time, they, they wouldn't be evangelical Christians. They'd likely be Buddhists or Hindus, and they'd believe in Ganesha, the blue elephant god, and they would think that equally rational and reasonable to believe, and they would make arguments for it or something like that. And So my point is that the difference between science and religion, if you went to India, they would not be doing a different kind of physics. They'd still be doing Newtonian mechanics, say, if India wanted to launch a spacecraft and get it to Mars, they'd have to use the same equations that American scientists use, and yet their religious beliefs are radically different, and that tells us something about the difference between science and religion. Okay, Mike, now I'd like to bring up... Um Another issue that came up for me, actually, starting with the, um, the first sentence of, uh, actually, the uh, dedication page of uh, why Darwin matters, and this gets at a, um, a really serious problem for skeptics and something that I've struggled with in my own career. Uh, you dedicate it to Frank Soloway, mm -hmm. and um, and I find that ironic because elsewhere in your book you talk about how science is this wonderful self-correcting process and how really good scientists uh, dedicate themselves to proving their own theories wrong and they accept counter-evidence and so forth. 
And uh, as you know, Frank Soloway, I guess his best-selling book was Born to Rebel. Mm -hmm. And um, and that book has always really annoyed me because I thought it was <laughs> such an, a, a wonderful example of how uh, social uh, science studies can be sort of twisted around to support any conclusion, particularly if you have a theory uh, with uh, terms as squishy as firstborn child and uh, conservative temperament versus rebellious temperament. So I, you know, I wrote about Soloway's um, uh, book in, in my second book and uh, was very critical of it. Um, and I, you know, I'm not going to ask you to defend Frank Solway, although you're certainly welcome to. But there are a bunch of things as I went through your book uh, that you mentioned that I have. Um, there's sort of scientific theories or figures who are peddling certain uh, scientific views that I find um, lacking all credibility. Another one is Ray Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. You mentioned him. Uh, Kurzweil is somebody who I think of more as a um, a religious cult leader uh, than a true scientist. You mention uh, string theory and the multiverse theory uh, for which there is, I mean, some of the smartest physicists in the world uh, support these theories, of course, uh, but there's actually no empirical evidence in support of them. So you see where I'm going. Uh, yeah, well, okay, I guess so I'm saying that maybe, you know, there are certain skeptics who have, I think, a double standard. There, there, there are some kinds of science that they give a pass to, instead of applying the same critical uh, mm -hmm. standards to them that they would say to ESP or intelligent design and mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I dedicated Why Darwin Matters to Frank because he's one of my best friends, and I spent a month with him hiking through the hinterlands of the Galapagos Islands and camping and all that, and that seemed the most appropriate. Uh, book to uh, person to dedicate my book to, and uh, th there's no other reason other than that he's my friend, and that's what you do in a dedication is you think uh, somebody special. So, as for his theories, well, I mean, what Frank does is no different from what any, any social scientist does. So, if you're going to be skeptical of Frank's methodologies, you really would have to be skeptical of m most of, of social science because that's how the, it's done. Now, maybe he's wrong, uh, but the process of debate and disputation and no, this theory is wrong because of this data. It's no different than, say, let's say uh, John Lott's book, uh, More Guns, Less Crime, uh, and that book is you know, debunked by uh, Freakonomics, and then he's got another book out debunking the Freakonomics guys. And you know, that's the normal part of science, the give and take and rough and tumble. And uh, So what you, know, you, you do in being skeptical of Frank, that, that's fine. That's what science does. And uh, you know, string theory, well, just in the last year, there's been two books published skeptical of string theory. Well, hallelujah. I mean, it's a good example of how science really does work, that um, it, it, you can speculate all you want. You can start off a research program with, you know, sort of metaphysics and philosophy, and this could be that, and anecdotes and all that stuff. Um, it, but at some point, you really do have to have some way of testing it. And if you don't, then eventually sci other scientists or colleagues will just give up and and you won't get funding anymore or whatever. And that, that's okay. That's good. And uh, so I think everything you've described, I largely agree with, is just the, the normal workings of science, science doing, doing well. Well, let me ask you this. How do you, I would think one of the toughest jobs for a skeptic is um, just figuring out what your target should be. I mean, there's so many, there's so many irrational beliefs, and there's this whole sort of spectrum. So obviously, string theory is uh, more, uh, there, there's more rigor brought to bear on it, at least mathematical rigor, even if not experimental um, evidence, than, you know, for example, astrology, or maybe even in intelligent design. But um, how can, with all these targets, how do you decide what to focus on? Is, do you look for things that you think are particularly harmful for society? Oh, in, in our case with Skeptic, um, we just look for sort of the hottest controversy around. I mean, we're a, we're a magazine. We're on the newsstands and bookstores. People want to, they're, they're only going to pick it up if it's something relevant, which is another reason why we don't bother with things like astrology and, and a lot of these uh, long-gone claims, uh, the hollow earth or flat earth society or whatever. 
I mean, we're going for like the vaccination autism thing because it's in the news. It's what people want to know about. 9-11 conspiracy theories, you know. We did a whole cover story on that because you know, something like 30% of the American public thinks that the Bush administration either knew something about it or was somehow involved in the attacks on 9-11. It's incredible. But there it is. I mean, I, I wouldn't have bothered with it at all because to me it's just silly beyond belief. But Nevertheless, so many people call us in emails, and there's uh, books and TV shows and documentaries and online films and talk shows covering it. It's like, okay, we have to respond to this, and we did. So that's basically the, the rule we follow. Yeah, so more sort of news value, because I would think, you know, obviously when you're talking about autism and the treatments for it and the causes of it, or, you know, we've already been talking about uh, psychiatry and there's the whole psychopharmacology industry I mean, this is science that has real consequences for people's health. It has economic consequences. Um, intelligent design and creationism and all that stuff, I don't know. I suppose the, the consequences would be if you get somebody, for example, in the White House who hold, holds these beliefs, then it might have negative consequences uh, for the rest of us. That's right. Are you right, looking yeah. for things that have sort of a you know, potential real political or, or social or yeah, economic. Yeah, th things that matter, yeah, definitely, absolutely. Uh, uh, although we don't deal with topics that are largely political or economic, mainly only because there's other people doing it that have much bigger budgets than I have. And, uh, I mean, some people say, why don't you track down that whole story about weapons of mass destruction? Well, I mean, you know, 60 Minutes is doing it, and they have, you know, they've, they, they got $10 million to spend on their investigation. You know, I have, you know, $2,000 to spend on it. You know, what am I going to be able to do? So, you know, we, we pick and choose our targets. And also that's, you know, so many people are already doing that. That, you know, I, I'm looking for areas that other people are not covering, you know, that sort of are in our sphere of influence. And uh, intelligent design might come back. I mean, it was a big court case in Dover. And so, of course, we had to cover that. And they may fade away, but uh, I suspect not. I think they'll keep evolving. <laughs> and uh, so we'll have to, you know, respond to whatever the next set of arguments are. And that, that's what we do. So, um, in the, the time we have left, I wanted to ask you about um, the science of good and evil. I, could you describe, I haven't actually read that, I've read about it, and I've read some essays that you've uh, written in which you, uh, you cite it, so you can just sort of summarize the, the yeah, it's, um, of that book. It, it, it's sort of the third in my belief trilogy, uh, Why People Believe Where Things is about science and pseudoscience, and how we believe is about why people believe in God, and and the science of good and evil is basically why we are moral. And uh, it, from an evolutionary scientific perspective, that is, what, what's the origins of the moral sentiments and can you be good without God? So basically that's what that book is trying to address. So the first half is about evolutionary ethics, that is, uh, how we evolved as a social primate species in which um, uh, cooperation and pro-social behavior and altruism is simply built into us. You, you, you have to be cooperative and pro-social. Uh, in order to get along with your fellow group members, in order for the group to survive, the social group to survive. And uh, so um, I actually argue that I think Huxley uh, got it wrong in this sense. Huxley portrayed evolution as nature red in tooth and claw, in Tennyson's famous phrase, and that it's nothing but cutthroat competition. And I think, uh, of course, that's par partially true, uh, but there's another side to evolution that is social evolution. What, uh, you know, the... the Peter Kropotkin called mutual aid, that, that also goes on. And we're now just discovering in the last 15 years of research that there's this whole other side, you know, Franz Duvall's research on the peacemaking primates. Yeah, yeah they fight, they, they bite, they kill each other, they're nasty, but, but, but they're hardly ever doing that. Most of the time they're sitting around grooming each other, eating together, hanging out together, just doing kind of regular stuff that we would do. And so it's not fair to portray a species as all violent and aggressive when in fact most of the time they're, they're being pro-social. So that's, I use that argument in The Science of Good and Evil to show uh, that in fact we are by nature moral. It, it is transcendent of you and I. Our morality does not come from whatever you feel like, John, or whatever I feel like. Um, it, it does come from something deeper and that's part of our human nature. And in fact, my next book, called The Mind of the Market, basically applies that same principle to the economy and market behavior. That, in fact, free trade, natural trade between people comes very naturally once trust is established between strangers. Once there's institutes in place, 
political social institutions that encourage trust, then people will gladly trade with one another because we are so social. And the whole idea of capitalism, I think, has been wrongly associated with that, that cutthroat social Darwinism. And uh, what we're discovering now is that, in fact, that, that nice pro-social side of human behavior usually is what you see in the marketplace. So, Mike, uh, you know, this touches on something that's been an obsession of mine with for the last um, at least four years or so. I, I guess it started really around the time of the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq. I started noticing in my conversations with people that um, I, I've always sort of had this hope that uh, we'll have world peace, as naive and romantic as that sounds. And uh, after 9-11, especially when, uh, when we uh, attacked Iraq, uh, I noticed when I, when I brought up this possibility of um, humanity getting past militarism and warfare, uh, people looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> uh, believe, you know, it was like I believed in astrology or intelligent yeah. design or even worse. Yeah, I read, that, uh, I read your piece. Uh, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with being sort of optimistic that way. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think the realistic view is that we are by nature tr pretty tribal and xenophobic and nasty, and that's why we do need social institutions. I mean, in my in my uh, early, earlier adult life, I was you know, a pretty strong libertarian, so I would argue what you're arguing, uh, but from a libertarian perspective. That is, uh, once we get rid of tyrannical governments and all government, in fact, then, then we'll achieve this. Well, I don't think that's true anymore. I think you do need certain social institutions in place, a strong military and so forth, uh, to, to keep those uh, the, the tribal nature of our nature in, in check. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with aiming for that. I think it's a good thing. Well, so let me just ask you, flat out, this is the same question. In fact, I just asked, I, I had my uh, second introduction to journal, journalism class yesterday, and I mentioned uh, you know this interest of mine in, in uh, whether warfare can end, and I asked my students flat out, do you think uh, war will ever end once and for all? And um, 12 students in the class, and everyone said no. <laughs> so let me just put that question, to, and, and that's pretty much typical. So it's, it's, pr it's uh, over 90% of the people that I pull in any venue are uh, fatalistic. Um, so, and the ones who are positive, you know, often it's for very... Um, Disturbing reasons, like they think that the uh, you know Christ will return to the earth and we'll have heaven and earth and, oh, right, and that, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So let me put that question to you, uh, as an expert in the answer. The answer would be under the current conditions, no. The, the way political states are structured, no. I don't think it's it's possible. Um, I think the way to get there would be a slow, gradual attenuation of the conditions that lead to war. So. The um, making political borders much more porous through free trade, for example, would make it much more difficult for freely trading demo liberal democratic countries to fight one another. This is uh, Thomas Friedman calls this his uh, uh, McDonald's theory of war. It doesn't quite fit that any any two countries with McDonald's won't fight each other. Well, they do occasionally, but his point is that the, the more porous the economic borders are, the less likely. Uh, those two countries will fight. I call this Bastiat's principle. Uh, Friedrich Bastiat has said uh, where goods cross frontiers, armies won't. Or where goods do not cross frontiers, armies will. Um, I mean, people want stuff. They want to, you know, they want to improve their life. And if you don't allow, allow them to do that freely, they may form coalitions and go just simply go take it. Um, and so that, that, that temptation, that, that tension is always going to be there. Uh, for me, free market capitalism is the best way to attenuate it. It's not guaranteed, but it at least decreases the probabilities. I mean, uh, no two liberal democracies, uh, r rarely do two liberal democracies ever go to war with, with one another. It's almost inevitably some sort of two dictatorships or a democracy against the fascistic or communistic or dictatorship. But two liberal democracies, say Canada and America, th this just isn't going to happen. Uh, today... Europe. The European Union is a sort of model for what you'd like to see happen yeah, around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Although not leading toward one world government, but just leading to porous borders where people can come and go as they please. Um, I mean, just pic picture it wasn't that long ago when these European states, half a little over half a century ago, were all fighting one another. Well, imagine would France 
you know, march its armies through the channel and try to take over England, or would Germany invade France now? Uh, all this is so unlikely, simply because they all have the same currency. Uh, that, that alone makes a big difference. Yeah, and after all, it's, it's not inconceivable, but it's a lot harder to imagine war between Europe and uh, Russia now That's than right, it was yeah, yeah. 15 uh, or 20 years ago. So what about one last question to sort of come full circle. What about the role of religion in uh, creating a more peaceful world? Right. Um, to me, as long as the political economic conditions are there that make it next to impossible for, uh, for people to want to fight each other, then it, religion really doesn't matter. It's when religion is married to the state and the state uh, has tight borders and control over its people and power, and giving power to religion, that's when it becomes dangerous. Religion is a force for tribalism, but it, for my money, the tribalism and the political tribalism comes first. I think religion is a tool in the hands of political uh, power. Um, uh, so here I differ, differ with Richard Dawkins, who sees the day when uh, if we eliminate religion, it will... It will, it will largely eliminate wars and, and that sort of thing. Uh, no more 9-11, no more 7-7, and so on, as he says. Uh, uh, I'd like to believe that's true, but I don't think so. I, I think um, those sorts of things would go on anyway under some other excuse. In other words, I think religion is an excuse. And that once we yeah. fix the social-political problem, it, it, doesn't, it won't really matter what, what, what religion people practice. Well, that's good. That's a pretty hopeful analysis because... Uh, uh, the way things are going now, I, I can't foresee religion. I, mean, I think a hundred years ago, if you asked leading intellectuals uh, where we'd be mm -hmm. now, you, probably a majority, if not all of them, would say, well, science will have displaced religious belief once and for all. And yeah, I don't think that's going to happen now. So, you know, there is something yeah. in the human psyche that just uh, really seems to need these sorts of belief systems. So, um, you know, if we have to depend on the elimination of religion for a, a peaceful world, then um, that's yeah. really a problem. So I <laughs> yeah. like your analysis better than Dawkins. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what um, I think. Yep. So, uh, okay, tell us once more when your uh, next book is coming out, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, the next book is called The Mind of the Market, and it comes out January 08, so I'll be doing a big book tour and lecture tour for that, and uh, yeah, so that's it. Okay, I look forward to thanks, it. Thanks, John. So, th thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Okay.